Welcome to the Momentum Collective podcast. Momentum Collective provides training spaces and community around the world for unconventional minds and nomads to co-create the future. This podcast shares ideas on how we can transcend and shift towards our highest self. On this edition of the Momentum Podcast, I deep dive into the concepts of healing inner and outer ecology with Sycamore, a renowned land steward, chef, and farm manager live from the beach of Nosara. So don't mind the ocean sounds in the background. Join us as we dive into comprehending structured water, stewardship versus ownership, and going beyond the dogma of diets and fasting. Hello everyone, my name is John Early. Really excited to have Sycamore here. Uh, farm to table chef and food educator and a very renowned land steward uh, we're excited to tap into um, pick his brain a little bit on things from water to seeds to the diet and to to food and what it means to really steward land so thank you for joining us here today Sycamore <laughs> thank you for the invitation and yeah. for hosting and you've been with us the last um, couple weeks here in Costa Rica and with us at our at our project in, in Macaw and at some of our masterminds and been really great to get to know you and how you approach things and your integrity with 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 being a land steward so what does being a land steward mean to you mm. <clears throat> yeah I suppose when humans say I'm in a relationship and they're usually referring to like a romantic or sexual human that they're in a relationship with I wonder if people could say that with the land that they live on Um, Like, what does it mean to be in relationship to land, particularly in a culture that is not grounded? Um, And as a nomad, to some degree for the last decade of my life, I empathize with that. And when we're not a place-based culture, it's really difficult to even imagine what true stewardship of a place would be like, similar to how you could really be in a long-term romantic partnership if you're not regularly seeing the person to be able to care for their their field or to care for the pastures and the fields that you live on so to me the most important part is to actually ground and to be a place Um, the land will actually teach you how she likes to be stewarded Um, just like any woman they will open up when it's in right relationship and will show you the parts that need some tending or just the parts that need some worship that can mean so many different things in each place so to me stewardship of course first is like place-based it's listening and then it's infinite when it comes to how every single little square meter of the land like asks for a slightly different touch and that's again through observation and adaptation that is only like practice that's never perfected Mm -hmm. and I guess to back up a little bit we're talking <clears throat> about instead of like, changing the terminology for those that are new to it, not Ownership. necessarily owning land, mm-hmm. but stewarding the land, caring for it, knowing that it'll to be passed down. And I mm-hmm. saw a really great quote of, "We don't inherit land from our ancestors; we borrow it from our from future, our, from future, our future, future children, future yeah. generations." Mm-hmm. And kind of having that longer lineage of of land and. Yeah, if you have anything to say on that <clears throat> need to have some sort of ownership or control as humans, specifically on and in regards to land. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole three, four hundred year history of the privatization of land that's really fascinating. It's actually what began a lot of Karl Marx's studies in the late 1700s, 1800s, like the commons were under attack, um, the encroachment, um, the privatization of the ground, and like what mercantilism and capitalism like did with that. It's been relatively recent that like every parcel, of course, on the earth is owned. Of course, there have been like kingdoms and empires that have like claimed certain spots. I empathize with the ownership dilemma because of how much security it seems to give in this legal system. The journey for me is how many people own land and then don't actually steward it. Right. And so many are yearning to steward that don't own and what will be the right relationship of shifting those dynamics. You know, sometimes when I find wealthy people's properties somewhere beautiful and they're just building a house and, like, doing nothing to the land, it's kind of like, um, it's almost like keeping a supermodel in your closet or something like that, <laughs> where you just, like, sequester the, the sacred ground away from those who it could benefit. And so I, um, 
I'm really inspired by things like land trusts and by uh, churches and ministries and uh, community projects that can actually steward the land cooperatively and in a circle-based way so that more of the land could actually be transferred. I'm really curious about uh, an, an organization my friend works with called Agrarian Trust, which is about kind of the non-linear and ex economically experimental ways that we'll be able to transfer large amounts of land in the coming years. Just one stat is in the United States, the average age of the farmers in their mid 70s, like the average age. And so what does that mean for the future of, excuse me, farmland ownership in, in at least the states and around the world? Um, we can't let it be like, which is the current trend, being like monopolized and uh, bought up by large corporations that are monoculture and annihilating the soil. So how does, how do people actually choose to steward land? It feels like one of the most important trends for our generation in the coming decades is to actually ground down in some location to choose to receive a part of the mother's body. And even if we're mobile and, and tending lots of places, like there needs to be anchors in a place um, arranged in whatever legal framework feels right for that place. Um, so that we can still, yeah, regrow Eden. Mm. And I think um, a big thing that you that you discuss a lot about, you have a lot of passion for, and which is a huge component to all of this, is water. Mm. Watersheds and clean water, and understanding and respect for that. So, how do you approach that with someone that's not used to seeing water as a as a sacred thing, a living thing? <laughs> how do you how do you <clears throat> begin to crack crack someone's mind open to a different perspective yeah mm. yeah it's it's hard to s compress my you know decade-long love affair with water into uh, a short experience but that's really what I'm hoping to do more these days is to initiate people into the path of water the most obvious thing we start with is like what percentage water is your body and what percentage water is the planet like we are both 70% water were water bodies. The fluids of our body, from blood to lymph, um, to digestive juices, to um, all cellular transmissions um, and communication, like are based on the water molecule. And to empathize with the way our body and the Earth's body communicates and flows and transports nutrients with this principle, it's 70% on a certain measurement, like I think by volume, um, the body, but it's actually more like 99% molecularly, like mm. the way water literally builds. Um, in the same way that a tree, if you were to measure it um, and its soil, um, it would it could grow to 200 pounds if you were to measure the tree, but if you were to remove all the soil, measure it at the beginning when it was a sapling, measure it at the end, the soil stays the same. It's the, like the water and the air that comes in that actually builds the material of the tree. So there has to be to me like some level of like first like enchantment or curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like what, like I'm not here to do a science lecture to people about the principles of water. But once people are inspired by that, like Dr. Masaru Emoto's work with <clears throat> the hidden messages of water or with um, a new author, Vita Austin, is showing like the crystallization of water and the power of intention to mm -hmm. where there's the potential to actually like beam good intentions into water freeze it beam harmful intentions into water like through your direct expression and freeze it and she has all the pictures and studies and people can look up these links if they're curious and actually witness the crystallization and the physical structure of water being different based on intention it's a total uh, portal that the um, Isabel Friend on Instagram, um, Gerald Pollack in the fourth phase of water. There's so much of the actual water molecule that could be explored on the Medicine Stories podcast. Uh, Isabel did a podcast as well there. Um, yeah, feeling into one is the, <laughs> the properties of the molecule itself and its universality and its potentiality um, on a major level. But then to come back to the earth and how so many are familiar with the carbon dioxide these days the ppm in the atmosphere the control and the protests for all of the fossil fuels that can be important in the destruction of land and the atmosphere to 
produce our industrial lifestyles, et cetera, et cetera. But what most people don't know about is the water cycle on the planet and the way that water vapor in the atmosphere determines a greenhouse gas and global warming potential and how when we reduce our global problems to like a parts per million of a particular molecule it of course is convenient for the powers that think they'd be to control that to trade it um, to reduce it to to regulate you know um, climate lockdowns and red meat and these kinds of things like this is what's bad because we can measure this particular thing but what we don't really back up and see is the way that the water cycles of course the carbon cycles do have been completely damaged on the planet and when I say that, I mean like 98% of mangroves and wetlands have been destroyed. Like, what does it mean if our coastal territories um, don't have their ecosystems protecting them? What does it mean if most of the rivers around the world can't be drank from anymore? Like, that the glaciers are melting. Like, to me, falling back in love then with the actual water cycle of the planet and to feel like, what would it mean to rehydrate the planet? So when we have deforestation, we then remove actually the, the um, cloud seeding that rainforests have the potential for. They actually exhale microscopic molecules that um, allow, I forget the specific name, the like aggregation of the water molecules around um, that to generate the clouds, to generate the rain, to then generate human it's civilization. A full, cycle, a full ecosystem. So like fall back in love with water and then like learn it, learn her through your body and through the earth. And you'll never uh, learn it all. It's, uh, it's, it's practice. A, it, yeah, totally, <laughs> it's infinite, yeah. And, and what do you mean by water? You know, that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. It's like, how do people really realize that this isn't just a clean thing? Oh yeah, we just drink it <clears throat> and it's all the same, but like, uh, what is structured water? What is vortex water? How can water hold energetic properties that infuse into your body in a good way? Um, Do you want to dive into some of that? What is what is structured water? Yeah. Um, so there's usually like two main categories, and I'm I've, I'm still learning about this thanks to my partner and other friends in the last year um, about the differences between what's known as bulk water and structured water. So water has a form, has an energy, has a um, if you were to look at the actual molecules and clusters in that bottle, like how many clusters are there and then what their shape is and what their energy is, if you can imagine water that's um, you know, coming out of an industrially treated urban location and being pumped through these huge pipes and then you know pressurized into each of the houses, like that water sits in pipes. It goes through 90 degree angles. It's eating up the iron or the plastic of the pipes and it's um, yeah being forced through all these different machines. I experience that corporately like uh, I am empathize with the water in that moment just like what it's like to be like in the dark like contained in a non-natural environment. Um, that to me is that's bulk water. It's, it's um, just being moved at a volume in a bulk amount um, <clears throat> without any consideration to the energetic properties that that offers water. Mm -hmm. Structured water, you can imagine as waterfalls, as streams. Um, even some people might have seen the like little concrete um, uh, pools or, or water fountains in people's yards. Like activity in water, exposure to air, um, and sacred movements. And the main person I look to on that is a man named Victor Schauberger. There's a really good book by um, his biographer Callum Coates called The Water Wizard, which helps us actually... Um, Schauberger was just brilliant scientifically when he actually measured and understood what these wave forms or movement patterns of water um, do to charge and energize the actual water molecules within them. Um, to allow them to then nourish the ecosystem and nourish the human body um, in a different way. So it's important that uh, I usually think of three steps, like we do need to filter our water to a large degree. Um, most of the time it needs to be then be remineralized. And this is if like, unless you have like a clean spring or a clean well on the property and that can all be tested and people can learn about those things. But filtering, remineralizing, and then structuring. Like we of course at least need to filter it, just structuring it won't remove like hyper contaminants. And 
And if we just filter it without remineralizing it, like reverse osmosis water can actually pull minerals from your bones because it's like hungry water. It like it has so little in integrity and structure that, sure. it, that it can actually harm the body. And so to actually filter it, remineralize it, and then to structure is kind of like the most ideal way to treat your water. And, and I have, um, yeah, I have many different systems at home um, from that actually vortex the water to mm. give it its shape. I much prefer to just drink out of streams and living waterways, but when we're traveling all the time and how do we... Yeah, because I believe most illness is dehydration, that actually mm. most cancer could be seen as that to where the body is so dehydrated that it can't communicate between its systems, its parts. Um, and not only dehydration, like we're not drinking enough water, we're not drinking living water. And so for, for, yeah, that's what wrinkles are, that's what aging is in many ways, is, is the dehydration on a cellular level. So that's why it is such a passion of mine, is because like on a planetary and on a human level, the lack of right relationship with water is causing an infinite amount of illness. Mm. And it's, mm. that doesn't have to be that way. And you can see it in streams. If you see a stream, mm -hmm. you can see how the natural patterns, especially with the maybe the rocks or the sediment, it spirals, it vortices, it creates this energy mm -hmm. that I guess would then be contained within the water rather than, like you said, just long, straight pipes where it, it, there's no there's no real um, activity mm -hmm. to charge charge the water. Um, so, what would you recommend for people at home? Like, what are some realistic things people can do? If they, if they live in the city, they can't just drink from streams there or um, yeah, if there's anything that you would recommend for drinking more active water. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, the most important thing is to fall back in love with water. Mm -hmm. And so if you're um, doing this from just a purely scientific standpoint, it's not going to motivate you. Like, there's a, there's a supernatural level to being in relationship with water that will then just carry the person to do their own exploration. On an absurd level, if, if you're wealthy, like find the local clean water sources and purchase those lands and preserve those springs and yeah, uh, preserve the first order streams like in the mountains. That's something that I've been living at is in the Sierra Nevadas in California. Yeah, and higher up in elevation before it reaches down. Exactly, and like find those places that can really be preserved. Um, Although just to like really answer your question is like when people are in the urban malaise, it's super important to stay protected from all of the varieties of toxins that come through food, air, EMFs, and water. And so if tap water is the only thing that people can drink from, which is, um, is for unfortunate number of people, uh, I call it tap liquid. Like it's, it's a liquid product that's not, I mean it's water based but the degree of microplastics and pharmaceuticals in most tap water is um, kind of an insult to call it water. Like when, when like the oceans we were in this morning is, is like, that's water, um, although that's also contaminated. I bring that up because um, it, it still deserves to be worshiped. Um, that water still came from a mountain, a stream, an aquifer somewhere. So first is find where your water comes from. All municipalities um, around the world will have a source. If you have to contact the water company or you have to go on their website, like actually find out. Um, for me, when I was living in Oakland, California, near San Francisco, uh, it was the McCallamy River, uh, the Sacramento River. Like, and for me, I then went and tracked where the McCallamy River came from and like found land higher up and like bathed in the waters that I knew would eventually one day get to my tap downstream and so to have a connection to that um, some of my friends created a film called Walking Water it was a three year long pilgrimage from the Owens Valley out in eastern Sierras California which is where for I think it's like over 300 miles that the LA Department of Water and Power this is Los Angeles's water source they like went and bought up tons of indigenous land and have since like channeled and piped in water from hundreds of miles away and people like actually walked that journey from those like true mountain streams all the way down and brought that water into the city just to bring awareness to like look at where our water comes from are we stewarding the, the source of the water mm. fall back in love with water and find the source is really a, f a first step um, 
from there there's filtration it's like an infinite rabbit hole of what types of filters and which ones you can afford or not. Um, yeah, the most car common are carbon-based, right? Yeah. Like they're common Brita filters and whatever. Does that actually get much out? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Um, I, I, uh, I usually am you know, working in the food realm, and I just love how much you're bringing it back to water because that's like where it all begins. Um, and I want to... Um, yeah, the Water is Life shop. Um, of Isabel is probably the best resource I've recently found where she has all of these resources. She has an Instagram and a, a website that has all of these various filters and information packets and this kind of thing. Part of that for me is like learning to delegate this information to those who have given like most of their life to that. Like I probably know more about soil than Isabel, but she definitely has a multi-dimensional connection to the water molecule. And so that's its own thing. The The most simple two things I would recommend are Berkey's. If people do want to get into that, it's a graphy filtration carbon system. You can get fluoride and chlorine <clears throat> additional filters to go onto it so that you don't calcify your pineal gland or destroy your gut microbiome with those two most common uh, water additives. And then the second is that I... Uh, I have a, uh, a Kangen electrolyzed reduced water machine, which is its own rabbit hole of multi-level marketing. Um, and so I'm not here to push that, but it does feel like in certain times, like alkaline and um, microbuster and um, antioxidant water can be really nourishing for the cells. So when I travel for events, I take that machine where I go because it removes pharmaceuticals and microplastics and um, chlorine from the water um, that I can just attach it to the sink and then it comes out like a, a higher more alkaline pH and then it, it also microclusters the water so it like breaks up the actual molecules um, so that it becomes more hydrating and more receiving to the cells filtration and energy and then remineralizing and then structuring are still the like basic three things um, I use also a Mayu M-A-Y-U it's like a glass uh, pitcher that sits on a base that's a magnet and there's a thing within the glass pitcher that spins and it actually creates like a, a vortexing tornado inside the water. So do that for five to 15 minutes before you drink the water and you can feel mm. a difference. And all of these are like <clears throat> right relationships, right steps. I mean, even just receiving the water and like thanking it can be a great first step. Like not everybody needs to invest in a thousands of dollars worth right, of filters right. and machines. And once we realize how foundational water is to our body and to our health uh, and to our energy field on so many levels, it becomes, it has for me, like the most important investment is that if I don't breathe well, if I don't hydrate well, then the food is actually a filler and a distraction f from me not having like the sun and deep breaths and quality water. Like food is actually fourth in the elemental uh, table for me when it comes to where I should be prioritizing and so in right relationship people should do their own research and fall back in love with yeah. you know, why this planet is alive absolutely yeah I, I really value that and like you said uh, awareness and appreciation I think if you know most of us almost all of us anytime we turn on a tap there is water instantly pretty much anywhere any room any situation any public place mm -hmm. and we never unless we're like camping or at a festival mm -hmm. and that's the first thing you do is like where's the water where mm -hmm. do we get our water from so it, mm -hmm. we're so far removed from the common basic instinct of where where's our water is it clean and yeah and even like that simple step of thanking the water even i know that's one of stephen brooks's uh, practices in the morning first mm -hmm. glass of water just say Thank you. I'm so happy to have clean water and how far that can go to just start instilling that appreciation for things. And also awareness of how much water is needed to grow a lot of the food that we have. I know we went down a bit of a rabbit hole on almonds. Uh, we can tap into some of those stories of like, you know, people shifting out of uh, cow's milk into almond milk. And even here, we're in Costa Rica right now, and people are buying almond milk from the U.S. and how kind of crazy that is. Um, but I'd love to let you explain a bit more of, of um, the, like something that's so common now in our culture for almond milk um, and the difference between almonds there versus other places in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I first 
got curious about this when Almond Breeze, the brand or whatever, I learned that like per half gallon, per like liter of almond milk, it's like three to four almonds are in that whole jug um, because of the amount of like gums and flavorings. So they'll add almond extract or almond flavor and they'll add like gel and gum and locust bean gum and xanthan gum. And they'll actually use some almonds, but as for how many is actually used, I forget, it may be like five or six, but like wow. it's per, per liter, it's not that much. And so, and then once I was like, okay, well shit, I wanna learn to make my own. And I started to make, I soak my almonds, strain them, you know, use fresh water, blend them really well in a high power blender and then strain them through like a nut milk bag. And, and then I started seeing how many almonds I was using. I was like, okay, why am I doing this? Like one, we could go into the, to the conversation of like uh, dairy and conventional dairy and the absolute travesty of monoculture, confined animal, GMO fed, like abused, tortured mothers getting their children stripped for them so that they can get plugged into a machine to extract their juices. Like obviously conventional industrial dairy is um, repulsive uh, on almost every level. And we can also go into conventional almond farming and how arguably it's one gallon of water per almond to grow an almond it takes a gallon of water and we're talking about thousands of acres of almonds particularly in the united states I mean, the california grows 80 percent of the world's almonds so if you ever need to check them out they're not hidden you drive highway 5 between san francisco and, and los angeles and there's um, huge monoculture plantations and what these look like are the same tree, the same variety, as far as the eye can see. Go down and try and dig up the soil. It's going to be about like this. Like pale, hard, crusty, dead. Because of the chemicals that they spray on it. Not just for fertilizer, <clears throat> but for the pesticides and herbicides. These, similar to chlorine and other additives in water that harm our gut microbiome, like this kills the microbiome of the soil. And so, is almond milk Ethical. Like most people in recognizing the harms and travesties of the conventional dairy industry understandably want to choose something different. Of course, most people don't question the premise that they have to have a milk product um, at, for whatever drink or thing they're eating. But if we just, if they switch it and they just go to something that's not dairy without truly examining the industries that are behind that or even what's in the products themselves. So like look at the ingredient labels anytime the next time you choose an alternative milk product and look at what's in there and look up the ingredients on the internet. We have this portal that we have access to and they do still thankfully have to label what's in the product. This stuff is, um, some of it's like petroleum derived. I mean, TBHQ is a preservative that's in some of these alternative milks that is terrible. Or look at um, oat is another common milk substitute. And these are often grown, again, on uh, conventional land, like sprayed with Roundup. And then, um, yeah, often with additives like canola oil. And so we're putting, like, arterial lining, destroying um, inflammatory oils into our, our milk products, sometimes even with sugar as well. And so I'm also sensitive to the fact of um, how complex this is. Mm -hmm. Like food is such a, a, a really complicated charade um, of marketing, um, of clever marketing. Um, that distract people from, from truly the source of it. And so I'm not here to merely uh, denigrate all food products, but I do feel like the, the veil needs to be lifted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all about how far people wanna go. Here we should be drinking coconut milk. I mean, we should either just have more coconut scrapers that we can make it ourselves, um, uh, or we should have uh, dairy, like actual healthy dairy goat dairy I mean when I managed a, a cow dairy in Wisconsin it was like 20 Jersey cows um, on 20 something acres of land and we rotationally grazed them and the calves got to stay with the mother during the day so that they were able to get the nutrients of the colostrum which is the milk that's the first three or four days after birth which is so important for the establishment of the gut lining of the, of the babies and when that's taken away or sold 
and the calf doesn't eat, uh, consume that in conventional operations. It you know destroys their health. It makes them not live as long. They're usually sold in the veal industry. So if we keep our calves with the mothers, if they drink the colostrum, if they can learn grazing patterns during the day with the mother, but maybe in the evening, the calf is separated. And then in the morning, we milk the cows. Um, it's once a day milking, rather than like three times a day with all these industrial machines. And then after they're finished milking, they go out in the fields all day. And we give them new fields sometimes every day. And so that milk was healing to the land, um, <clears throat> arguably ethical because of it was natural fertilization too. It wasn't artificial insemination, like the conventional rape industry that does it with, with cows. Like this was the best dairy I've found in cow. I think goat is a whole nother option. The point is, are the animals healing to the land or are they hurtful? Arguably 98% are hurtful uh, in the industrial world. But in this world, there are places nearby here um, that would benefit from animals grazing. That would totally be more ethical than uh, consuming California almonds, not organic, um, pasteurized, all of these kinds of things. And so to me, it's rather than being about diet and dogma and, and rules, <clears throat> like vegan is the only ethical way um, kind of self-righteousness, it's really important to kind of explore these things with one or another and to not trigger the shame or the like, I have to do things right energy. I empathize with people so much about how they like want to do it right and there's so many factors to consider and so like let it be a self-love journey for your own body and for the planet to be like, oh my gosh, once I saw those almond plantations, like I don't consume California almonds or really almond milk at all anymore. I don't feel like I need that. That's not an essential mm -hmm. part of my diet. It's arguably disrupting to my body. So for me, it was like, I love myself and I love the planet too much to want to consume that. Do I still sometimes want a little coconut milk in my, uh, my turmeric lattes? Like, yeah. Do I always check every package when I go to every cafe? Like, no, like I'm fallible and human as well. And I hope that this was like some degree of a opening into how we can really like explore these options let it be nuanced let it be curious yeah. so that we don't fall into the next marketing platform and the next for the next gates funded lab food like there's so much more out there yeah well you'd mentioned as well on soaking the almonds mm -hmm. and i think that's something that um, a lot of people don't realize that some things were not meant to be um digested in, in eaten but digested through our, our system if you mm -hmm. want to touch on some of that of like seeds versus nuts and, and other components yeah it's important to feel yourself as the food so if you were um, yeah and to back up just a bit is the transition from perennial foods and hunter-gatherer types of lifestyles where we were eating like um, more wild from the land and to this like monoculture and usually annual based foods that we're now eating um, which allows us to settle down, allows us to harvest and store the excess crop, um, like rice, wheat, barley, rye, corn. Right, things you have to plant every year versus things that just exactly continue. Exactly, and so mainly fruit trees are great examples of things that just continue every year. Nut trees, um, animals, like these are perennial that they keep giving once you get them established but these annuals and particularly like grains and seeds if you can imagine being um, a seed like a bean uh, or a nut like the almond is the seed of the tree um, it's inside a fruit um, if you've ever eaten an apricot uh, if you know the pit inside of it, if you ever cracked the pit of an apricot it looks just like an almond they're both in the same family so that we eat the apricot, that's the fruit, that's actually much more digestible, but with the almond, we're attempting to eat the seed. What is a seed meant to do? Like it grew its whole, you know, often annual cycle to be inside of a fruit so that it's consumed by a mammal, usually. The fruit is, and usually the seed goes with it, like an apple. Like the seed actually wants to be eaten because that's why it grows this magical fruit around, or at least wants to be picked and nibbled around and then tossed down. But really, it would love to be eaten in the, in the whole. Why that's important to say is that means the seed is meant to survive digestion. And it has digestive inhibiting compounds inside of it, often known as phytic acids. And so these phytates 
are compounds that actually prevent, and when they go, when it drops into the gut, releases to to prevent our gut microbiome from breaking it down, which is a brilliant thing, and that's why we've all seen like corn or pumpkin seeds in our excrement, is because the, it's able to survive this huge digestive tract because its purpose is to grow. And some seeds actually need to go through an acidification process, or like it needs to go through an animal's gut to even germinate. Mm. Sometimes they'll just like lay on the ground and die because they haven't been abraded or like broken open by the teeth of an animal. That's called scarification of a seed. And then stratification is the process of like temperature or acid or pH like needing to help the seed germinate. So these seeds want to live. That's why they have these compounds in them. And we can trick them a little bit by soaking them in water, which um, makes them think it's rained. And then they'll release these compounds and then um, start to sprout. That's why it sprouted nut milks are much easier to digest if we're going to go that route. So almonds, I even do that with sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, those kinds of things that if I'm going to eat these types of foods, um, I'll soak them, rinse them, let them sprout a little bit, and then dehydrate them again so that they don't have as many. Uh, of course, it can be easier to get your vitamin A from liver of a deer or a cow much easier than it is to eat 15 cups of pumpkin seeds that have all been properly soaked and digested um where did, can i actually get my liver from a deer that was a roadkill animal um, i have a whole freezer full back home from two that we processed just in a month uh before i came here compared to me like growing all the pumpkins but then i would have to like scoop out all the seeds to dry and, and such or arguably my pumpkin seeds come from China so like where do our nutrients really come from and what is most bioavailable um, compared to McDonald's beef that's like fed all of that garbage and living in its own excrement and treated so poorly like I would not want to put that vibration that flesh into my body so I will choose plant-based foods I will soak my rice and rinse my lentils if that's my option but there's but if we're shipping in lentils from Turkey or something and really uh, your land actually needs goats, then like let's make uh, goat cheese and goat sausage and tend the animals in a good way and not claim it's ethical to ship in and rinse the lentils. And if that's your chosen diet, at least process and, and soak and eat the foods in a way that makes them the most digestible possible because it's also important that we honor the foods nutrients to actually receive them to actually make them bioavailable and to truly assimilate them i feel like that's a whole nother subject of chewing and of um, digestion enhancing processes so that the food you do eat actually can be received by the body so that we can need less because we're actually um mixing with our salivary enzymes in a certain way, or we have the right HCL, the hydrochloric acid content in our gut, or that our small intestine, large intestine isn't leaking. Like leaky gut um, prevents us from truly assimilating those nutrients. So I think that gives us full circle to your question about like being able to really understand how the foods we're choosing to nourish ourselves with can best be honored by allowing them to be bioavailable and regional and like part of the larger story of, of this planet in a good way. Mm. And I really value that of like honoring the food and also knowing within context of what's the most appropriate thing, mm -hmm. not just living within a box of like, it has to be vegan. So even though I'm on the other side of the world, I'm gonna ship in quinoa from Peru yeah. or almonds from California yeah. or, or whatever or saying, yeah, it's just making sure that there's some context there. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've got a lot of experience working with the gut and com uh, compositions there. And the gut really is our, it's our second brain. I mean, we have so much um, that I, I think we're just starting to realize uh, we're, we're completely dependent on our gut to, to, to feel, to understand, to, to I mean, if you want to go into a bit more of what you feel are the, the main components of why the gut is such a crucial part to our being human and our, and our, and our feeling body as well. 
And when you said second brain, my heart jumped in and was like, am I the third brain? You know, <laughs> it's like these three centers, like, and we just kind of realized how many neurons there are surrounding the heart tissue and surrounding the gut tissue. Um, so there's like centers of intelligence, just like our chakras, like we can receive and give information in a lot of different ways. And it's so profound that um, you have a gut feeling about right. something like that was just kind of a phrase at some point at least when I was growing up I don't think my parents used that understanding the depth of the psycho or how literal it could be <laughs> exactly yeah how literal it is to have a gut feeling you're actually feeling there you're actually processing storing transmitting information in this area and that's maybe the most important place to start is that the gut receives information not just from like the solar plexus energetic portals of this dimension like this but I mean like internally the food we eat is not just calories it's communication it's um, information from the ecosystems and so when I eat a Thai red banana like grown on this tree over here compared to when I eat like a dull conventional banana grown in a Costa Rica plantation like those aren't the same potassium contents and that's all that there is there's actually a whole matrix of story within those cells and so when the digestion uh, occurs it's not simply just a mechanical extraction of amino acids there's actually I'm still discovering what types of stories can be metabolized through the gut um, this um, it's called the alimentary canal from the mouth to the ass like this entire chain of esophagus and stomach and small intestine large intestine colon is a pathway that um, has its own care you know um, to me it, we start here and my mom's a dentist so like oral health and oral microbiome and like 22% uh, of our microbiome of our body is in our mouth just 27% is in the gut and so those are different amounts but the, the mouth almost has as much going on with it as the gut we're just learning about what gums and the tongue and the glands and how it all works together to truly start the process mm -hmm. of digesting some of our only enzymes break down carbohydrates are in our mouth it's powerful to know that what happens here of course the sacred power of the word but then the internal power of choosing to chew our food in a good way to like begin that mm -hmm. process this is not a garbage disposal down here that can just chop up all the things we inhale yeah. like it's really important starts with the saliva starts with all the, like, yeah, the full components and and how many bites do you think are recommended like for you to chew your food like i mean most of us chew it like 10 12 times like that's another like exercise for me just like with where does your water come from the environmental working group has a website to look it up and to test your water and to put in your zip code but like with our food it's recommended like 30 to 50 times. Like try that sometimes to like really let the food break down, like go slow with it. And from there, like to jump to the other end, if we brush our teeth, hopefully often enough, um, which is a whole nother separate conversation about flossing and oil pulling and uh, tongue scraping, like, but at the other end, we don't brush our other hole. Like, why do we not do the care of that region, like enemas or uh, colonics and hydrotherapy there? Like, there's a, there's a superpower in these two areas of the enter and the exit for uh, optimizing our neurology as well. The power of infections here to spread to the heart, to spread to other parts of the body, the brain. Like, the mouth is a really unique portal to the rest of the body and how interconnected it is through the blood and nervous systems. Enemas are a whole nother conversation about the power of the colon to feel the body. You know, it's the last place that the food and the other systems, you know, um, feel before it's released. And, and that's one of our central elimination pathways, like defecation, urination, and then perspiration and respiration are four main elimination pathways. And so to actually eliminate in a good way means keeping the internal tissues of the colon clean and most people have forgive me impacted fecal matter as in like five to 15 pounds on average of matter lining the intestines of the gut if you can imagine the last 20 years of your food like going through a 25 foot long wet sock like there's gonna be 
matter on the inside of that sock, particularly if it's processed or inflammatory foods that haven't been digested well. And so to actually have a semi-regular practice of, of cleansing in some way, and that can mean juices, it can mean um, water fasting, it can mean um, raw foods, depending on your diet and your capability and your agony, like your digestive fire, like what would be better for people? I mean, to me, it usually means getting off of like heavy foods like gluten, dairy, and meats temporarily just to allow uh, like a high fiber diet to flush out. Some people use clays or binders, like bentonite clay, like activated charcoal or psyllium husk to, is my favorite combination of those three to actually like mix with warm water and flush and drink lots of water so that it like kind of brushes the inside of the, of the canal. You can also do more sophisticated cleanses. There's like grapefruit juice, olive oil, liver flushes. There's my favorite is a mucoid plaque flush by a company called Zen Cleanse, Z-E-N-C-L-E-A-N-Z that does a one day, arguably two or three days, I guide clients through that work of actually choosing what level of a fast they want to go on, what level of a cleanse, so that, yeah, because I believe as we've all, I, I would say most of us who have chosen to juice fast or to water fast <clears throat> or to have a colonic, like the feeling you get afterwards is like a high. Um, and that high is a return of feeling. It's a return of mm. direct perception. And the body, on a surface area level, the skin is claimed to be the largest organ because of how much surface area it is. The, the endothelial tissue is the largest organ, which means like all of the surface area of the whole alimentary canal. And when we calculate and perceive how, how permeable those linings are, some say it's like one or two cells thick in certain areas. That's why if the, it gets clogged with plaque, or if it gets injured through like Roundup, which destroys the lining of the gut. Whole nother story about um, Dr. Zach Bush and the shikame pathway and the way that like the destruction of the pests or the uh, weeds um, and the microbiome that is killed by Roundup in the soil is uh, the same microbiome that is in our, our soil, our internal gut microbiome. And so when we consume these chemicals that destroy the lining of our guts, then our immune system, that's the prevalence of autoimmune disorders that have been rising in the last 50 years like this. It's due to the chemical toxicity that destroys our gut lining. All that's to say the integrity of our digestive system is so important to the integrity of our overall body. And it, it often doesn't get as much like respect. It's kind of like throw it down the chute, let it chew it up, and just whatever shits out, shits out. But there's like, and somehow the body just like gets all the prana it needs. When really, when we choose to care for this whole system and in a good way, then our whole feeling centers can open up mm -hmm. so that we can actually do our holy work in a better way. That's part of what motivates me to care for this. It's not just like a self-righteous, like I have the, the best digestion or something. It's like, actually, I want to support people not having IBS in the background, not having these like chronic fatigue syndromes that like prevent people from showing up. And so often that had, that did start or is still ongoing due to digestive imbalances. And so mm. if we can heal from our mouth to our ass and in between with healthy foods, with probiotics, like there's so many more things to say about it. But the most important, just like with water, is to like fall back in love with your body. Mm clear the shame fear dogmas and realize the potential you have to tend this temple mm -hmm. to truly like once this body receives like your attention and love and like you begin to sense the imbalances and then like find your toolkit for the ways that you can heal these internal systems like the body will mirror that care and like care for you back so that it can then hold you upright to do more of your your good work yeah, if you're blocked here, it's hard to channel the your intuition, your 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 your, your mission. Exactly. And um, yeah, I know it's been a buzz lately to do more fasting, intermittent fasting, juice cleanses, that kind of a thing. Do you feel like that's a more natural method to have regular fasting because we didn't used to normally have such a regular intake of food every hour or mm -hmm. a couple hours that we're awake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, fasting is, uh, I recommend 
Stephen Herod Buner's work. Uh, he's an amazing herbalist, alchemist, wizard, um, the, the lost language of plants, plant intelligence in the imaginal realm. But Stephen Herod Buner, it's B-U-H-N-E-R, the transformational power of fasting. For people who want to go into that, he just discusses the emotional, spiritual, and physical rejuvenating principles of fasting. And fasting is a its own rabbit hole of history. You know, Jesus did what for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert? You know, Buddha, Muhammad, um, Guru Nanak of Sikhism, like all of these uh, masters um, knew the power of it, of this tool, which and R Rumi has incredible poems on it, Hafez. So there are, there's a lineage to this. This is not a new fad. You know, just like permaculture is not new, it's an, an adaptation of an indigenous technology. Fasting does not need to have a thousand online courses and all types of like expensive probiotics to allow you to do it. It really just means stepping back from your usual consumptive patterns. There's intermittent fasting, like you mentioned, of, of each day, like go, choosing to go without food um, for eight really 12, 16, sometimes even 20 hours. And so your eating window is actually narrowed during the day. I prefer to eat in the middle of the day when the sun is high and, um, and, and not eat late close to bed. Fasting can mean, like I said, choosing to uh, go up the pyramid from like really heavy, uh, always cooked foods to like more raw foods to like smoothies to juices to water and then to dry fast which is a whole nother um, portal for people's imagination. A, f a friend of mine just went through a 20 day dry fast. Nothing for 20 days, no water, um, just breath. Uh, he was living on the ocean, so he, um, there was that. But what are the capacities of the body to actually heal itself? Mm -hmm. That's another really important thing in this pharmacological, psychological operation takeover that's unfolding on the planet is that the premise of all of this is that we need the state to be healthy. We need these pharmaceutical for-profit companies that profit from us being sick, that we need them when really, when we tune back into the prayer of the water, the prayers of the food, and the inherent brilliance and, and the inherent technology that is the, the human body. That the body is always healing itself like when i cut my toe like it started to heal instantly yeah. like yeah, it you don't have to think okay white blood cells do this or that if it knows what to do when you get a cut you know when you have a headache like these kinds of things of course maybe drink some water if you have a headache like if you have a cut like maybe wash the dirt out of course but like the, the re and you could even put um oils and serums on that help the skin regenerate but like that's it's to recognize that that's the inherent impulse of the body. <sighs> like what a gift mm -hmm. that is. That like, and to not just believe that, but praise that element in the body. We could of course mirror that to the whole earth. That the yeah. earth is wanting to heal the whole time and all we need to do is stop attacking her and we need to stop attacking our bodies with inflammatory foods, inflammatory emotions, um, toxins from XYZ location. So fasting is really just stepping out of the way, giving the body the space, the capacity to do that work because it wants to do that inherently. And then we can support its detoxification principles. We can support its cleansing and flushing, its hydration. But the first thing is to actually like stop, like get out of that abusive relationship. Stop talking to that person. Just give yourself some space from that abuse. Like mm. so many people are abusing their body through uh, unconscious inhalation of inflammatory edible like food products like yeah. so then we get to examine our cravings we get to examine what we lust after like what is really the object of our desire yeah. and how can that process be coached facilitated and dr buner has some incredible prompts in the book so that as you're fasting you can actually go through the spiritual and emotional unraveling that is the typical consumptive process and so fasting is not simply a fad or a hashtag it's one of the simplest and most ancient healing technologies and it's a portal into our own yes. our own psycho spiritual healing as well yeah even observing like when we say i'm hungry often i feel we feel hunger 
when we're not full. <laughs> you know how how are you really hungry? And I'm saying that to myself yeah, because yeah. I, I snack all the time. Me too. Um, and I really value what you're sharing of um, food that we eat is really we're consuming the stories of the ecosystem. And that really that really landed for me. Or when Al Noor of Brave Earth um, on a podcast with him, he was sharing, you know, the question of w- what nourished our ancestors. Like even that awareness of like what what food staples were the things that brought us here in the past seven generations that we're still holding on to within our bodies of our, our past generations. And um, we don't have too much time left, but um, so that now there's this new, not new, but uh, another buzz thing is permaculture, of coming back to recreating the stories and our connection with the food where it comes from. So I'm curious to hear from you, what, how do you define permaculture? Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, giving thanks to the man who created the term, Bill Mollison, you know, rest in peace, died a few years ago. Uh, he had uh, an incredibly complex personality, as most of the visionary white men of the late 20th century were. Um, many benefits he added to the scene and, you know, many relational uh, wrecks he left in his wake. I'm, I mentioned him to just honor him and David Holmgren, the founders of this work, because it is an invented concept that pulls together a lot of things that is arguably not too original in itself. Um, But to be more specific, permaculture is a compound word of permanent in agriculture or permanent in culture because Mollison and Holmgren saw what the state of modern agriculture and the state of modern culture was in its displacement and its unraveling and its uh, annual tillage types of uh, systems to where we didn't have a settled culture. We didn't have a settled Um, agriculture system we had this constant mechanization and destruction of the land so it is a a land-based principle like that Mollison's uh, it's important to note had a deep relationship with the Australian Aborigines and through his understanding of the 20,000 year cycles of tending the land of that continent um, he was able to intuit and learn so much about traditional uh, planting, raising, migratory practices, burning practices of the bush, like how to um, rotate with the seasons. He learned so much through the indigenous people, so that's the foundation of permaculture, is who has tended land for millennia well. Yeah. No nation state that exists today has done that. Like, Syria is a wasteland, like Iraq, you know, capitalism, industrial empires, complexities, et cetera, et cetera. Like, agriculture and its story deserves some uh, reflection and some uh, intuition uh, in combining indigenous practices and modern uh, science in that permaculture is known as a design science. It's not actually like a gardening how-to manual. Permaculture doesn't tell you which exact species to plant. Sure, at the back of Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie, one of the best like temperate uh, permaculture books, there is a species table that Eric Tonesmeyer, the author of Perennial Vegetables, um, incredible man, like put together like 50 pages worth of tables with all this type of content. So there is a lot of agricultural wisdom in it, and permaculture starts with three ethics. Earth care, people care, and fair share. Care of the earth, care of people, and distribution of the surplus. It then goes into 12 principles that Holmgren especially mapped. Um, you know, some of the basic ones are to observe and interact, to value the edge and the marginal, um, to accept feedback and uh, to change, uh, to uh, obtain a yield, and <clears throat> to value renewable resources. And so there's a whole system of design within that to where these ethics and these principles can actually design not just gardens but and, and land management systems, but buildings and economies and relationships. And so the fields of natural building, the fields of sacred economics, the fields of social permaculture have so much to teach us as well for how we communicate. You know, Starhawk, uh, bless her heart, a dear elder in the permaculture scene, she weaves earth-based magic into her permaculture courses at the Earth Activist Training. And she also teaches social permaculture courses. Her book on that is the Empowerment Manual, where she uses these principles, these ethics, and these biomimicry 
uh, learnings through the ecosystem to help us design our relationships, our conflict restoration practices and community. So permaculture itself, I think, is a brilliant uh, adaptation of a lot of body of work for Western, you know, kind of industrialized peoples to have a, a, a hashtag and a portal to drop into and then design from because you'll be able to find a whole other um, learning systems through permaculture as a nexus. So, of course, permaculture didn't create natural building, like wattle and daub, um, which is, means stick and mud, was, you know, in England for the last 1,000, 1,500 years, probably much longer in other areas of the world. So they didn't invent that, it just kind of pooled these concepts. And so that's what I love so much about it, is that once we kind of clear up the complexity of the white man who invented it and how much it uh, co-opted indigenous practices, um, once we truly like can drop into the portal that it is, it offers such a wide array of exploration for what I feel like is the most essential craving these days, which is to be in right relationship mm -hmm. with ourselves, with one another, and with the earth. And that's the foundation of it. It doesn't offer an exact rule book. It offers like uh, a self-guided exploratory design path um, so that we can utilize the vast amount of knowledge and skills that exist out there, um, but to do it in a way that, um, yeah, care of the earth, care of people, and, and distribution of the surplus. Something yeah, well, like that. Well said. <laughs> and we're so excited to keep you engaged with um, bringing some of that wisdom and permaculture and, and, and relations with our food <clears throat> and with our land and the way we steward it mm -hmm. um, with all of our projects moving forward from Mm -hmm. um, momentum to Project Ka to also uh, Macaw Lodge and Green mm -hmm. Residency. So um, it's been an honor to travel with you the last couple of weeks here in Costa Rica. Um, it's our last day together and excited for the next steps and continuing to, to shine that awareness and that light um, mm -hmm. for everyone mm -hmm. moving forward. So thank you again for, for joining us, Sycamore. Um, my name is John Early. Thank you guys for tuning in and dropping in and being the stewards of your own temple, your own body, uh, your own lands. and. Uh, Keep shining that love and that light. Mm. Thank you. For more info or content from Momentum Collective or to apply for one of our international artist residencies, visit MomentumCollective.com. That's Momentum, M-O-M-E-N-T-O-M. -E Momentum podcast theme you're listening to is the track Beam Me Up by our friend and producer Arterium. For more eclectic soundscapes, find Arterium on SoundCloud.